Hello. My name's John Gooch, and I'm Professor of International History at the University of Leeds. My specialization is war in the 19th and 20th centuries, particularly the two world wars. And what I'm going to talk about now is the central powers in the First World War. The central powers, that is to say, Germany and Austria-Hungary initially, and later on Turkey as their third partner, entered the war with a variety of aggressive territorial aims. The Germans sought to establish beyond any question their supremacy in Europe, to capture the resources and territory of Belgium and northern France, and to set up a central European autonomous economic empire. Beyond that, they had ambitions to take parts of the British Empire in Africa and elsewhere, and to establish German supremacy at sea. The Austro-Hungarians fought a different war. Their enemies were the Slavs in the Balkans, who had been, or at least seemed to have been, responsible for the assassination of the heir to the throne, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, that started the war. And behind them, the Russians, always supporters of the Slavs. There were then a variety of different objectives, but perhaps the two most important factors to bear in mind at the outset are, first of all, that the Central Powers were fighting on many different fronts. Initially four, France and Russia for the Germans, Serbia and Russia for the Austro-Hungarians. That meant a dispersal of effort, and one of the central questions that faced the Germans and Austro-Hungarians throughout the war was where might that effort best be concentrated. It was a conundrum that probably they never really solved. The other thing to remember as we start is that although Austria-Hungary was very much economically the weaker power, the Germans could get at Austria-Hungary, whereas the Allies could not get at Russia, or not at all as easily. And that meant that the Germans were able to prop up their partner for longer, and therefore to stay in the war for longer than might otherwise have been the case. The downside to that position was, of course, that they had access to the resources of Central Europe, but the Allies would, because of their command of the sea, have access to worldwide resources, particularly the wheat from South America and the raw materials and finished goods from the United States. So the basic strategic positions of the two combatant sides were quite different. For the Central Powers, the First World War started with offensives in the East and the West. The Austro-Hungarians attacked in two directions during August, first in the southeast against the Serbs, their traditional enemies, and then against the Russians. In both cases, in a matter of a few weeks, they were thrown right back to their starting positions. By the end of August, the Austro-Hungarian armies under Marshal Conrad had fought brief and bloody campaigns which had cost them 420,000 casualties in dead, wounded, and prisoners of war. Conrad had lost one-third of his army in a matter of weeks. These numbers rather make the casualty figures in the West pale into insignificance. The Germans attacked in the West and sought, by moving through Belgium, to outflank Paris and destroy the French. It was an ambition which, by the 9th of September, had self-evidently failed. Von Moltke, still the chief of the German general staff, although he would not last very much longer, wrote to his wife on the 9th of September 1914, it is going badly. The battles to the east of Paris will go against us. One of our armed armies must fall back, and the others will have to follow. The great hopes with which we began the war will abruptly change. Moltke was suffering from a crisis of confidence, and on the 14th of September, he was replaced by General von Falkenhayn who would himself direct Germany's military effort for the next two years. Over in the east, the Russian armies had briefly invaded Prussian territories and been faced at the Battle of Gumbinnen. 
And then, in the middle of August, two new and ultimately extremely important military figures appeared on the scene. Generals Hindenburg and Ludendorff were sent to command the Eastern forces, and they halted the Russians at the Battle of Tannenberg between the 26th and the 28th of August 1914. By the early autumn, then, the position had somewhat stabilized for the Central Powers. No progress had been made in the southeast or the east, but in the west, the Germans now controlled Belgium and 11 provinces of northern France. The issue which faced the Central Powers at the end of 1914 was where to concentrate their efforts. Like the Allies, they were divided between Easterners and Westerners. Falkenhayn no longer believed in the pre-war German ambition of a strategy of destruction, a Vernichtungsstrategie. Instead, he argued that the better course was to make a compromise peace with Russia in the east and then focus efforts on France and Great Britain in the west. But there were powerful Easterners who opposed him, first and foremost Hindenburg and Ludendorff, who were carving their military reputation in the east and wanted more soldiers, more battles and more victories. The German Chancellor, Beitman Holweg, also opposed the idea of peace with Russia. And then, of course, there was the Austro-Hungarian ally, for whom Russia was one of the major opponents. All of this made Falkenhayn's position and decisions extremely difficult. In 1915, two new strategic factors came into play. The first was Italy's entry into the war on the 24th of May, 1915. This opened up a third theatre for Austria-Hungary and was to preoccupy her for the next three years. Austrian troops held off Italian attacks along the borders of the empire, but it cost them heavily. And ultimately, they needed German support against the Italians in the last year of the war. In the east, the Austrians with German help, enjoyed dramatic successes during 1915. A campaign was begun with the Battle of Gorlitza Tarnow on the 2nd of May 1915, and very rapidly the Russian forces collapsed and retreated. Undermunitioned, underarmed, and often badly led, Russia was a vulnerable ally, and the Austro German forces were able to take full advantage of this. By the time that this campaign ended, on the 19th of September 1915, the Germans and Austrians had advanced 300 miles, reaching the city of Vilna, and they had taken 850,000 Russian prisoners of war. These numbers are quite remarkable, but we should bear in mind the vast size of the Eastern theater of war and the fact that the numbers of men engaged were spread relatively much more thinly than they were on the Western Front, which does much to explain a war of movement in the East and does something to explain these extraordinarily high numbers. So in the East, then, the war was going well for the Germans and the Austro-Hungarians. In the West, it was not. During 1915, the Allies launched a series of offensives, culminating in the Battle of Luz in September 1915, which caught von Falkenhayn completely unawares. This was ammunition for his critics, and the debate between Easterners and Westerners opened up once more. It was resolved, at least for 1916, at a crucial Imperial Crown Council meeting which took place on the 21st of December 1915. Falkenhayn went through the options for the Central Powers. They could attack Moscow, but that, he said, takes us nowhere. They could put more resources into defeating Italy, but this would not decide the war. They could not take the offensive against Imperial forces in Egypt, Iraq, Palestine, on the peripheries, and certainly not in Persia or in India. They did not, said Falkenhayn, want to start a crusade like Alexander. The West, he argued, was the place where decisions could be made. Breakthrough was not possible because of the strength of the defensive and the flanking fire that artillery and machine guns could bring into play against any attack. 
What was possible, he believed, was to try strike a serious blow against France. If the French military effort could be brought to the ground, then Britain, who was using France as her sword, would follow her into some form of compromise peace. This was the logic behind the Verdun campaign, which began on the 21st of February 1916 and lasted until the 10th of September of that year. Verdun is written into French history. Virtually all the French army went through the battle and many of the interwar leaders and post-war leaders, including Charles de Gaulle, went through it too. It turned out that attrition, which is what essentially Falkenhayn was aiming for, bled the attacker as much as the defender. Casualty figures are notoriously difficult to arrive at. But the best seem to be these, that at the end of that campaign, the Germans had lost 527,855 casualties, that is dead, wounded and missing, and the French had lost 377,000 231. Smaller numbers than those that were falling on the Eastern Front, but still large enough in themselves. Not only were the Central Powers shaken by events at Verdun, they were also shaken by events in the East also. After the crashing defeat of the summer of 1915, the Russians regrouped and reorganized. And on the 4th of June 1916, under their General Brusilov, they launched a dramatic new offensive and rapidly began to roll up the weakening Austro-Hungarian armies. Within a matter of weeks, Brusilov took 400,000 Austrian prisoners, forced Conrad to abandon offensives in Italy, and showed the weakness of Austria-Hungary. Indeed, these defeats in June 1916, many historians believe, signaled the end of Austria-Hungary as a military power. From now on, she was essentially being propped up by Germany. 